we got a rare three hour block of AEW on a Wednesday night because of March Madness. So Rampage was bumped up to Wednesday. So we had a live Rampage following Dynamite, which is why you are seeing me now when normally you would see me earlier. And I will tell you now, having sat through this, I don't want to do this every single week. So hopefully this was only a one time thing. But they were in Toronto. Toronto is a great wrestling city traditionally. Tonight was no different. The crowd was up. The crowd was packed. They actually had, if they weren't sold out, they were pretty close to sold out for tonight's show. Uh, they were at the uh, Coca-Cola Coliseum, I believe it is. You know, you could tell when Dynamite has a good audience because let there be light. You can see the crowd. The crowd is more well lit when they have more people in the building. How about that? This was a one-match show tonight, and we're just talking about Dynamite here. I mean, we are going to talk about Rampage, but I'm saying when I say one-match show, I'm talking about Dynamite. Because there was actually uh, quite the spectacle with the ladies at the end of Rampage, which was the only reason I even wanted to watch Rampage. I wanted to watch Rampage because they had a street fight scheduled with Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale taking on Julia Hart and Sky Blue. And I thought that there might be some storyline developments there. I thought Mercedes might come back out. That didn't happen. But those women went out there, and they had a hell of a, hell of a street fight. But it was a one-match show on Dynamite. That one match delivered. It was the main event for the TNT Championship, pitting Copeland against Christian. Part three, the blow-off to their feud, the big 40-year friendship. It all culminated tonight in an I Quit match in the main event, and I thought that match delivered. And uh, I look, if you're going to do a match in Toronto with Edge and Christian, then you know that the crowd is going to be up for it. But the crowd was also up for it for a lot of other reasons, too, because they stuck a lot of hockey references into that match. So if you are a hockey fan, and I am not, but even still, if you are a hockey fan, then you probably enjoyed that match even more. But Adam Copeland is the brand new TNT champion now for the second time. As I look at my uh, watch here, his title run is already longer than his first. So congratulations to Adam Copeland. Okada is also a champion. Didn't take him very long now, did it? We just saw Okada make his official AEW debut only a few weeks ago. And already Okada has gold around his waist. He is the continental champion after beating Eddie Kingston tonight. Mercedes Monet was on the show one week after her debut with Big Business. She had a promo, so did Will Ospreay. He had a much better promo than Mercedes did, but they both had time to talk on the show to address the audience. You had to have them both on the show, more so Mercedes than, than Ospreay. Um, I actually was kind of surprised he was there, to be honest with you, because I know Ospreay is traveling back and forth every single week from the U.S. to the U.K., and so I expected him a big business. I, I didn't know that he would be there this week, but he's been there every week so far. He has been a weekly uh, performer for them up to this point so far. And he had a much better promo this week even than the one he did last time, and I enjoyed the last one that he did. But it's important to get them both on the show uh, right now as much as possible because they're trying to establish them and establish their stories heading into Dynasty. They're still brand new as far as full-time to the main roster. Uh, I say main roster. Forget which show I'm watching sometimes. There's only one roster here in this company. But they're both new to the uh, full-time AEW roster. So it's important to get them on the show as much as they can. Tony Khan has found a better balance between the in-ring action, which, you know, in the past you have weeks of Dynamite where it's just match, 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 match. Backstage segment, match, backstage segment, match. They don't even give you time to breathe but there's a very heavy emphasis on the in-ring action. And you got to strike a balance. You don't want to have a show. And I've seen plenty of Raws, for example, in the past. It's a three-hour show where they give you very little in-ring action and they give you way too much talking. And then you also can go to the other extreme and you can have too much in-ring and not enough emphasis on story and promo time. And I feel like Tony Khan over these last few weeks has found a better balance between the two. And the trend also continues of them announcing big matches for Dynamite in the month of March. I don't know what got into Tony Khan, but so far, we're already 20 days into the month. We only have one Dynamite left for the month of March. But Tony Khan has loaded these shows up 
with big matches and big segments. Obviously, last week was a special show in Boston. But we already have two big matches announced for next week. Uh, we're going to have Swerve Strickland getting into the ring, and he's going to be going one-on-one -on -one with Kanosuke Takeshita. And we also have Will Ospreay, who's going to be back again next week, and he's going to be getting in the ring with the man who Brian Danielson beat on Collision the other night, Katsuyori Shibata. Anything you can do, I can do better. So those two matches are already official, plus they're doing the Young Bucks and Private Party as part of this tag team title tournament. Uh, but already announcing some big matches, and, you know, he, he wants to end this month on a high note. And that's what he's going to do, and I will tell you now that, <clears throat> you know, as we approach the end of March, this has been the strongest month of AEW television, I feel like, in a few years. Just the way he has loaded these shows up. The, the, the shows have a different energy to them with, with the new signings. Uh, I don't know if the new signings have caused him to rethink the way that he's putting these shows together. Because it, it's not just the new stars that you know have been part of this uh, kind of change in the way Dynamite feels. But ever since they showed up on TV, Mercedes, Okada, and Osprey, there's just a different vibe to the show. And I like it. It's a different energy to it, and I hope that that continues into April, May, June, July, and beyond. I want this to continue beyond just the month of March. Um, Dynamite is uh, coming up next week. I didn't catch where Dynamite is. I think they may still be in Canada, but Dynasty is a month away. And so with Dynasty coming up next month, we see the main programs, what they're going to be. Clearly, they're building towards Swerve Strickland and Samoa Joe one-on-one -on -one for the AW World title. Obviously, they've already announced Brian Danielson and Will Ospreay. They're going to have a huge first-time-ever match on that show. And you can see some of the other directions are already very clear, uh, becoming clear for Dynasty. So I think they're in a good position right now. You know, whether the numbers bear it out or not, we'll find out. I guess we'll see when the numbers come in. But uh, I'm less concerned about that. I'll let Tony Khan worry about that. I just want to watch the show and be entertained and not feel like they're throwing too much shit at me without giving me a, t a chance to breathe and absorb what's going on. And they have done a much better job of that lately. Dynamite has been a very enjoyable show. But this is your AEW Dynamite and Rampage. We'll get to Rampage later. This is your Dynamite and Rampage double review. I can't remember the last time I did one of those. Although back then it was usually a, a, a double SmackDown Rampage review, not, not Dynamite Rampage. But it is March 20th, 2024. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. 400 likes is the goal for Be the Booker tonight. Super chats are open. There is a brand new one, courtesy of The Rock, that has been added, if you can find it. Uh, that is on the list. And a, a quick plug here. This is going up tomorrow. And I am warning you right now that it is a bit of a shit show. But this is going to be going up around noontime tomorrow, so keep your eyes peeled for it. I played episode two of Sound of Gamer for WWE 2K24, and it may well be the last time you see me playing 2K24. And it has absolutely nothing to do with my performance. It really doesn't. It has everything to do with the fact that this may be the glitchiest game that I have ever played in my entire life. You will see why tomorrow when this video goes up. And that is all I'm going to say about that. When you see what I went through, when you see what happens in this video, you will understand where I am coming from and you will sympathize with me and you will, you will understand where I am coming from when I say that. The buggiest game that I have ever played in my life. Let's talk about this show. Not going to get angry about that. We're going to talk about Dynamite. Show opened with Tony Schiavone in the ring to introduce the newest addition to the AEW roster, the CEO, as she calls herself, Mercedes Monet. And Tony promptly left the ring once she got inside because she took the mic. I guess she had no use for him. So Tony Schiavone went to go sit down at ringside. Now Mercedes is in the ring. Obviously, the reaction to her, she got a nice reaction. Nothing like in Boston last week, but she got a nice reaction. And she reiterated how excited she is to be in AEW. She put over her CEO name a lot. You can't watch this segment and not know that this woman calls herself the CEO. She made that very clear. 
She said this was almost taken away from her after she was injured in her New Japan Strong women's title match last year against Willow Nightingale. She said for all the people who may not know who Mercedes Monet is, she put together a little video to give us a little taste. This is almost heelish what she was doing here, but she pitched it to a video and they had footage in there of her on the red carpet for the Mandalorian. Uh, footage of her doing a runway fashion show, and also some footage of her matches from New Japan before she got hurt. After the video, she said that she was rocking and rolling, everything was going really well, but it all got taken away from her. But, minor setbacks, she said, make for major comebacks. And she wants to make the mission very clear. She's not here to lead a women's evolution. I, you know, I, I seriously, I, I roll my eyes every time I hear that now. She's not here to lead a women's evolution. She's done that before. She's here to lead a global women's revolution. And to face the best women in AEW and all over the globe. Now, about last week, when Julia Hart and Sky Blue attacked Willow, they must not have heard when she said that she had unfinished business with Willow. And anyone who gets involved in her business is going to go bankrupt. Lights went out, and when they came back on, Julia Hart was in the aisle way. Sky Blue tried to ambush her from behind, but Mercedes took her out. Julia tried to attack Mercedes. Mercedes got her on her back for her uh, moneymaker finish, but Sky was able to pull Julia out to safety. And the heels went and they retrieved chairs from under the ring. So they each had chairs. That brought out Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander with chairs to come to her aid. And the heels bailed. Now Willow had a chair in her hand. And she was standing in the ring. She was behind Mercedes. She had the chair. She was kind of teasing that maybe she was going to hit Mercedes with the chair. When Mercedes turned around, she saw Willow with the chair. Willow immediately dropped the chair. And Mercedes was... Upset that Willow thought about nailing her with it, Mercedes left the ring. Only two weeks in, and it already feels like there is a, a new focus on the women's division. It's mainly centered around these four women. But it feels like there's more of a focus now on this women's division, because think about it. You know, last week on the show, they opened with Mercedes. Last week on the show, they closed with Willow against Riho, and then Mercedes again. She came out at the end of the show. That's how they opened and closed. This week, they opened again with Mercedes, and they closed. Te now, technically, it was Rampage. It was not Dynamite, but they closed with the women. They closed with Julia and Sky and Willow and Chris Statland. Two weeks in a row. I'm surprised Tony Khan didn't have a stroke. That right there is progress if you're a fan of the women's division in AEW. Because when was the last time you can say back-to-back -back weeks here on television that you saw that? So that was very noticeable to me. Uh, Mercedes in her promo, it was not a great promo. She stumbled a few times over herself. Uh, and honestly, if you pay attention to what she said, she didn't have a whole lot new to say than what she said on the show last week. She did mention that, you know, I said that I have unfinished business with Willow and she brought up Julia Hart and Sky Blue, but, you know, otherwise there just wasn't a whole lot there. Really nothing new, radically new from what she said last week on the show. Uh, it is important to get her on the show. It is important to get her promo time because they are trying to establish her. She is going to be the face of the women's division now, right? That's how they're positioning her. She's a big signing for them, uh, but it was not... I would not call this a strong promo. It was a necessary promo, but hardly a strong promo. But when it was over, I'm thinking, okay, they're, they're going to close Rampage tonight with the other four women. Are we going to get a Chris Statlander heel turn? Because I'm convinced that's where we're headed here. And I thought we were going to get it tonight. As it turned out, that was not the case. Off is a direction you can fuck. <laughs> well, all right then. Hey, M. Mills. Boy, that was mean. M. Mills breaking in our new $23 Super Chat. M. <laughs> M. Mills, thank you. I love it. Love it. 
So earlier today, Alex Marvez was in the back, and Alex Marvez was going to try to catch up with the challenger in tonight's match for the Continental Championship, that being Kazuchika Okada. So Okada and the Bucks, he, did, he didn't have to go searching for them. Okada and the Bucks, they showed up in the hallway right next to him, and Nick Jackson wanted to, uh, he wanted Alex to address Okada in his native tongue in, in Japanese. Matt said that he's been practicing his Japanese in Duolingo, and uh, he spoke Japanese to Okada. The Bucks said that since it's a Continental Rules match, well, Nick said that since it's a uh, Continental Rules match, that means that uh, they can't be out there ringside with Okada. But Matt assured them that uh, we'll be on headset backstage. And in fact, we are going to be Okada's personal producers for this match in the back. Okada spoke in Japanese, and then in English, he told Eddie he is coming for his title. So Okada made his entrance for the Continental Championship match against Eddie Kingston. Before Eddie came out, after Okada came out, but before Kingston came out to make his entrance, uh, as Okada's in the ring and he's getting ready, they cut to Renee Paquette. She was just outside the ring. She was ringside, and this was something different. I like this. this. This was something that they have not done on the show before. She was talking about Okada making his AEW singles debut tonight and that she spoke with Eddie earlier in the day. Kingston told her that anybody had a 50-50 shot of winning, but he is out to dispel the myth of Kazuchika Okada. This was basically like a sideline interview on Monday Night Football. This was very, this was part of that sports-like presentation uh, that we've seen more of in, in some ways in WWE. And I will say, you know, WWE, because they have a new head of production there, they have made a series of uh, little production changes that have been very noticeable. I just talked about this on Monday during the Raw review, and it's refreshing. You know, it's different. I like what they've done. AEW has made a few changes as well as far as the, uh, they have that one kind of hard camera angle sometimes where it's like from above. Uh, I I'm not a... Huge fan of it, but I, I do like the fact that they're trying new things. This was cool. I mean, it's just one of those little things that stand out because they haven't done it before. Um, but I like the changes that we've seen from both companies recently. So this was only for the Continental Championship. This was not for the Ring of Honor World title. This was not for Eddie Kingston's uh, New Japan Strong Openweight title. Okada backed Kingston into the ropes. He teased chopping him and then... He didn't. He kind of patted him on the chest. Classic Okada. He backed away. Kingston, though, went right at him, and he got him in a seated position, drilled him with a chop to the chest. Both men ended up outside the ring. Okada put Eddie down with a DDT on the floor, and Okada flashed a grin at the camera. They cut backstage, and we saw the Jacksons sitting at Gorilla right next to Tony Khan. All three men were on headset. After a commercial, Kingston went for a home run shot. Okada, though, delivered his picture-perfect drop kick, a thing of beauty. Air raid crash followed. Kingston, though, kicked out. Okada rolled through a top rope elbow attempt, ran right into a spinning back fist. Kingston could not capitalize right away, though. When he did, Okada popped the shoulder up just before the three count. So Okada was able to come back with a Rainmaker. The problem is, when Okada went for the Rainmaker, Eddie got his hands up, like this, to block the shot. And so when Okada threw the clothesline, he hit Eddie's forearms. So Eddie went down. So did Okada. Okada was selling pain from striking the forearms. We got dueling chants of Let's Go Eddie and Okada. Okada gouged Eddie's eyes. Paul Turner saw it. He yelled at him for it. The back fist missed, Okada picked Eddie up, and then uh, dropped him, drove him down to the mat, and then he picked him up and he hit the Rainmaker and he pinned him. Okada beats Eddie Kingston and we have a brand new Continental Champion. Uh, they did not waste any time in getting gold around this man's waist. Just a matter of a few weeks and already Okada is a champion in AEW. Uh, the match, it felt quick. But it went 15 minutes, so it's not like they gave them very little time. It just, it just went by very quickly. And I think part of it is, and maybe a big part of it for me anyway, I'm so used to seeing Okada in these long, drawn-out matches. 
Because that, you know, the thing about Okada is he has these long matches. They start slow, and you can kind of tell when it's going to go super long. Uh, you know, in New Japan, he had tons of 35, 45, 50-minute matches. And even at some of the shows here on American soil, when they would have some of these New Japan shows. I mean, he wrestled Will Ospreay, I think, at Battle in the Valley a couple of months ago. I mean, a lot of his matches have length to it. And now he's going to be on weekly television, and he's not going to have the chance every week to go out there and have 25-minute, 35-minute matches anymore. So a 15-minute Okada match is super short by his usual standards. So it went by very quickly. Uh, They cut to the back. This was kind of goofy. So I mentioned before they cut to a shot of the, the, uh, the Jacksons sitting at Gorilla during the match. When the match was over, they cut back to Gorilla And there was a delay of a couple of seconds where when they cut to it, you saw the Bucks just sitting there. And then a second or two later, they popped up like, oh, shit, the camera's on us. And then they start celebrating uh, Okada's big win. So that was that was kind of goofy. But they shot off some pyro in the arena for Okada. Then Pac's music played. Pac walked out on stage. He stared down Okada and then he just walked to the back. But he made it known without saying anything. Uh, Just by coming out, he made it known that he is coming after the Continental title. Now, you didn't actually think that Eddie Kingston was going to beat Okada in Okada's first singles match here in AEW, now did you? I mean, come on. Now, there could have been some kind of a non-finish, but I, I honestly had not thought of the fact that because it was a Continental title match, per the rules, nobody can be out there at ringside. I... I completely forgot. I thought those rules only applied to the tournament. I didn't know those rules extended to every single Continental title match. Uh, So had I known that, then yes, of course, I would have said there's no way that Okada is not leaving this match with that championship. But uh, so much for the Triple Crown. They made such a big deal about this being the modern American Triple Crown. And Eddie Kingston walks out of the tournament at World's End with three titles. Not even three months later, and the Triple Crown is no more. And you know what? It's for the better. Because frankly, there shouldn't have been a Triple Crown to begin with. And what the hell does Okada need with... What the hell does Okada need with a New Japan belt that isn't the IWGP World Heavyweight title? I mean, really. What does he need with the Ring of Honor World title? Right? He doesn't. He doesn't need it. It serves no purpose to put those belts on him. That's why they weren't on the line here. So that's why he only won the one belt, because the other two were not up for grabs. And, you know, I'll I'll tell you something else. Because Tony Khan has talked about how how it's going to work going forward. They're going to bring back the Continental Classic. And so the Continental Classic is going to be an annual thing. Whoever the Continental Champion is at the time of the next tournament, which I assume will be the very end of the year, that person will be automatically entered into the tournament, and they will be defending their title throughout the tournament. So if they lose, then we're guaranteed to have a new champion. That's the way it's going to work. The reason this doesn't really work for me, this don't work for me, brother, right? The reason it doesn't work for me, and not the tournament. I actually, I like the idea and the concept of the Continental Classic. We got some great matches in that tournament this year. That, That was great. It's what's on the line. And I said this at the time, and I still feel the same way three months later. When you have a round-robin tournament like that, and clearly this is their G1, okay? So you think about the G1 in New Japan. What is at stake in the G1? The right to go to the main event of Wrestle Kingdom to challenge for the IWGP World Heavyweight title. That makes sense. Because that's the richest prize that they have in New Japan, and the G1 is grueling. It is a grueling tournament. And if you're not going to become the champion, the next best thing is to win a title shot so that you can try to become the champion, right? Makes sense. So when they announced the Continental Classic, I thought, well, as far as what's on the line, it would make sense that the winner receives an automatic shot at the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. They're going to play this tournament out over a period of weeks. It's going to be a a grueling tournament, round robin. Everybody gets to face each other, and you have something like that at at stake at the end of all this and instead what they did was they just announced a brand new title as if we don't have enough of these already in AEW they have an epidemic of titles in this company as it is so they announced another title and then Eddie was like well I'm going to sweeten the pot and put my belts on the line and we'll throw those in there too 
And that's how we ended up with the Triple Crown. The reason that the other titles were not on the line here and that they got rid of this Triple Crown nonsense, it was an Eddie Kingston thing. That was the storyline with Eddie. He chose to take his two titles and put them in there. It was never meant to be a situation where it would become a permanent thing. So that's why the Ring of Honor World title and the New Japan Strong Openweight title have sort of fallen to the wayside. All they did was just create a new belt. Would it not? Now think about this. Think about the talent that they had in the Continental Classic this past year. You had Daniel Garcia. You had a few names like that. You had a lot of big names in that tournament. You had an Eddie Kingston. You had Brian Danielson. You had Swerve. You had all these people that were in there, right? Like top names in the company. Why, if you are a top name in AEW, would you put yourself through this grueling month-long tournament, right? This round-robin tournament over all these weeks, just to win, when it's all said and done, a random new mid-card belt that they created out of thin air. That's the prize that you get. Meanwhile, they threw a scramble match at the last minute on the Revolution car. They put eight guys in a match. Wardlow wins. He gets an AEW World Championship match. Two weeks later, he's wrestling Samoa Joe for the title. So they threw a, a scramble together for a world title match, but you can't put a world championship match on the line at the end of the Continental Classic? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. That's silly to me. I mean, you want to have something tangible. You want to have the, the Continental Cup to, to present something to the winner. I get that. That's perfectly fine. But there needs to be something of actual importance on the line in that tournament. And if I'm a top guy in AEW, storyline-wise, I'm looking at that going, fuck, Wardlow won one match at Revolution and got a world title match. What the fuck am I putting myself through here? I'm breaking my neck, wrestling all these people. For what? <laughs> For what? It's stupid. Now, the thing about putting the title on Okada, at least, is that Okada is a big enough name where if anybody can help bring some value and make this title feel like it actually means something of, of, of any great note, it is Kazuchika Okada. And now he's got the title. Obviously, he'll be defending it against Pac, most likely a dynasty. But now he can keep that title warm until Kenny Omega is ready to come back, and you've got your match. You've got Okada and Omega for the Continental Crown waiting in the wings whenever Kenny is ready to come back. And I hope it's Wembley, but it may not be. Whenever he's ready to come back, though, they've got that match ready and waiting to go. Because Okada's not dropping that belt until Kenny is ready to come back. Now, to the back. Renee was uh, there to interview Swerve Strickland and Prince Nana. Swerve said that Samoa Joe tried to humiliate him by choking him out two weeks ago, and he said that he has his own history of choking people out. And Joe has been running from him. Swerve said that he was inspired by Mike Tyson, who's uh, been sparring and getting ready for his upcoming fight. So what is it? It's uh, Tyson. Is it, uh, is it uh, Jake Paul? Right? It's Jake Paul that Tyson is fighting on pay-per-view? Or on Max? Or Netflix? <laughs> I don't know. Eventually, I'll name the correct streaming service. I think it's on Netflix. So Tyson's almost 60 years old, and he's fighting again. I saw his sparring video the other day. I mean, he looks like he, he, can, kill, he can kill me in two seconds. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. He's, he's getting up there in years. So, anyway, he said that he was inspired by Mike Tyson sparring. And uh, he wants his own sparring partner tonight. And he says, whoever AEW chooses for him, just make sure that it's a big man. So we got an open challenge. At least it wasn't for a title. If Swerve wants to have an open challenge, then that's fine. My issue was that you had all these champions having open challenges, even after they announced their stupid ranking system. I think there were still open challenges going on. Which is probably one of the reasons why the rankings are no more. They lasted two weeks. Rest in peace, rankings. After a break, Renee was in the back with Chris Statlander, Willow Nightingale, and Stokely Hathaway. Like I said, they're already giving these women more attention and more TV time on these shows than they ever have before. Mercedes interrupted Statlander in the middle of her promo. Statlander said, look, I've been uh, meaning to say this. And she thanked Mercedes for having Willow's back last week. Mercedes said that's what a CEO does. 
and she's excited to watch her street fight later because you know what they say, payback's a bitch. And Statlander walked off. Willow went to go thank Mercedes, and Mercedes cut her off and said, you've done enough, and walked away. And before Stokely could shake Mercedes' hand, she was already gone, so he left him, she left him hanging. But he asked Willow, he goes, why are you so worried about Mercedes? You broke her ankle. What are you, what are you worried about her for? And Willow walked off, and that left us with Stokely, who stood there and looked at the camera and just shrugged. Smart, though, to let people know. Now, I thought it was smart that they would let people know that Mercedes was going to be watching that main event later and possibly might show up, but then she never did. But you want to get people to stick around and watch, so it was smart to at least tease that she might show up. Now, next up, we had Chris Jericho and the FTW champion, Hook. And uh, this was the low point of the evening tonight. Even though they were in Canada, Jericho came out. Now, he's not from Toronto, but still, you know, these Canadians, they like to stick together. They're, they're very loyal to each other. Well, not so much to Jericho. Jericho came out, and he didn't get the rousing, positive response that you would think. He got a very mixed reaction coming out. Maybe it's also that he's not coming out to Judas. He's still coming out as Lionheart. So he's coming out to his Lionheart music. Very mixed response that got more negative as the match went on. That's poor guy. This poor guy. Brings a tear to a glass eye. Poor Chris Jericho is getting booed in Canada. So the bell rang, and Hook proceeded to suplex Jericho all over the ring. The first half of this match was just Hook trying to lift up Jericho, and he and he got him up. Boy, he had to work for it, though. And uh, he was throwing Jericho all over the ring. He was dropping him on his head. After a picture-in-picture -picture break, Jericho finally countered one of the suplexes, and he tried for the walls of Jericho, but Hook fought out of it. Jericho went to the top for an axe handle, but he jumped right into another suplex. Hook went for a home run lariat, ran into a big boot, and a lion saw for two. Both men got to their feet, and Jericho tried an overhead throw in the corner, and this was very scary. Tried to throw Hook, and Hook, you know, again, it's one of these things where you can say, well, it's Jericho's fault, or it's Hook's fault, whoever's fault it was. Jericho vaulted this kid, and he almost killed him because he fell way short of the turnbuckles. So what happened is Hook looked like he almost got driven. He got spiked almost face first into the mat on this overhead throw. He didn't quite make it completely overhead and uh, almost got killed. So Jericho went to the corner, and he was delivering punches in the corner. Then it looked like I think he was maybe going to try for the uh, Hurricane Rana off the top that he still does sometimes. Hook, though, countered into Red Rum, and he got Jericho in the submission. They ended up on the mat. The crowd booed when Jericho escaped Red Rum. So did I, by the way. So the crowd booed, but they loved it when Hook countered the walls of Jericho into an inside cradle for the flash pin. And Taz on commentary pointed out, Hook Sr. pointed out on commentary that it was Hook's first pinfall win in AEW. Which is true, I guess, because every other win that he would have picked up would have been by Red Rum, right? It would have been by a submission hold of some kind. So this was his first pinfall win. After the match, Jericho walked over to him to pay respect, and he gave him a fist bump. This was not great. This was a heavy lift for Hook on uh, some of these suplexes. And even though he got him up for it, and you could say, well, that's impressive, him throwing Jericho around like this. I didn't think it made Hook look all that good, and Jericho didn't look good, and I didn't think this was really any good. Um, I don't think it did either of these guys any favors, but, you know, Hook wins with a flash pin. Hardly a decisive win, but a win is a win. He's still got a win over Chris Jericho for whatever that means, and Hook needs some big wins. So it was good to get him a W. Uh, but again, the thing is, I'm not sure how much a win over Chris Jericho means at this point. You know, I mean, because he's on television every single week, because he's been there from day one, he's been a heel, he's been a babyface, he's been a heel, now he's back to being a babyface. Except you, no one's told the audience, because the audience certainly wasn't treating him like a babyface tonight, uh, in Canada no less. 
it's tough. I, I really don't know what value there is left in, in getting a win over Jericho like this. I mean, not, not that it doesn't mean anything, but it certainly doesn't mean what it would have meant once before. It does not mean that anymore. So I don't know how much value or how much more credibility it's going to give to Hook. I know that's what they were going for by giving him a win over someone who is a former AEW world champion. Jericho was the first AEW champion. And Jericho has been around for a long time. He's the veteran, right? He's he's a future Hall of Famer. He's all of these things. But because he's around so much and it's just he's been overexposed, you know, it's to the point where people don't want to see him. They want to see him go away for a while. I don't know how much that's actually going to mean for, for Hook. And backstage later, Renee caught up to Jericho. And she asked Jericho if Hook won his respect. And he said, Hook lived up to what he was hoping for and showed him that he's a future world champion. Jericho said that next week, he has a proposition for Hook. Oh, God. Oh, God. If he offers Hook a spot in his new faction, Hook needs to lock in Red Rum and choke him out. Choke him out until he goes blue and don't let go. Because we know, we all know how that works. We had the Inner Circle, we had the Jericho Appreciation Society, he's going to make Hook the first member of this new faction, and that's going to be the beginning of the end for Hook. So Hook needs to choke him out very quickly. Choke him out and don't let go. You know, look, a Jericho heel turn would not be the worst idea in the world, especially given some of these crowd reactions he's been getting. Uh, it would actually be kind of a smart way, frankly, to, to mask some of those reactions. But I think the smart thing to do isn't turning him heel, it's not putting him in a team with Hook, it's not doing any of this. The smart thing to do would be to get him off TV for a while. He is completely overexposed. He needs to go away for a while. We got a vignette with Adam Cole. Adam Cole was sitting in a chair, much like he was when he was reading us that uh, story about Wardlow before his match with Samoa Joe. He said that he hates the feeling of being disappointed. And last week, Willow, Willow, Wardlow. <laughs> hey, at least, at least Willow, I think, won her match. Uh, no, Wardlow disappointed him. Cole said that Wardlow failed when he challenged Samoa Joe for the AEW World Championship. He said that Wardlow had one job, and he failed. He said that he, and then he corrected himself. He goes, uh, uh, Wardlow should be the AEW world champion right now. Cole said that Wardlow's new job, he's got a new job now, his new job is to make sure that the other members of the Undisputed Kingdom hold on to their titles. So Roderick Strong, Taven, Bennett, that's his job now. Make sure they hold on to their own gold. Cole said he cares about Wardlow, and he wants what's best for him. He said he wants Wardlow to reach his true potential and told him not to screw it up. If he wants to reach his true potential, he should be walking over to the... Uh, to the office, the corporate offices over there in Stanford. I think that's pretty much what's next for Wardlow if he wants to ascend to the next level. Because clearly it ain't happening here in this company. They had their chance with him and they blew it. Multiple times. So Wardlow now is right back in the same position that he was in before with MJF. Where he is subservient to his master. Now I want to point out something to you. One very big difference here. When Wardlow was with MJF, MJF had him under contract. So legally, we were supposed to believe that there was nothing Wardlow could do. He had to be at the beck and call of this man for whatever he wanted, right? He was kind of lording that over Wardlow. As far as we know, there is no contract between Adam Cole and Wardlow. So what is stopping Wardlow from showing up next week and beating the piss out of all these guys and taking Adam Cole in his wheelchair like Zack Ryder and wheeling him off the stage onto the ground? What's stopping him from doing that? Nothing. As far as we know, right? Nothing. And yet he'll probably still be a part of this group and he'll still watch, you know, Roderick Strong and he'll watch Taven and Bennett and he'll do exactly what Adam Cole wants him to do. How are they going to explain that one? Now, I can see where this is probably going. This is all going to build to MJF's eventual return, and we're going to get this little unholy alliance of sorts between MJF and Wardlow. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right? I, could, I could see it coming. 
And I just don't know what that's going to do. And that's going to get a nice pop. It'll get a nice reaction when it actually happens, if it goes down that way. But I just don't see, how does that benefit Wardlow? Where does he go from there? Let's say it plays out exactly that way. In a few months, MJF comes back, right? And the two of them, they don't like each other, but they're willing to work together to take down the Undisputed Kingdom, which shouldn't take too much effort. I mean, you got one guy in a wheelchair. You got Taven and Bennett. I mean, give me a break as far as how they're positioned. And then you got Roddy. Now, Roddy is a beast. I mean, he may be hard to, to take down one-on-one, -on -one, but, you know, not, not exactly uh, an overwhelming force is the Undisputed Kingdom. So what does he do next? Where does Wardlow go from here? There is no obvious direction for him. He is no better off now than he was a few years ago, and actually, he's in a worse position. He's in a worse position. Because at least before, with the MJF stuff, he was all the way on top, and he was on top of the world after he beat MJF. That was the peak. I can't even see him getting back there. He's going to be on the same side with MJF. At least before, he beat MJF up. Ten power bombs later. Where does he go from here? I don't see it. Tony Schiavone was in the ring to introduce us to someone who actually is on the ascent in this company. The aerial assassin, Will Ospreay. Came down to the ring. Great reaction for Ospreay. He apologized. First thing he did. He apologized for being a naughty boy the last time he was here in Toronto. That, of course, uh, was a reference to his match, his win over Kenny Omega at Forbidden Door. He said that uh, he's a changed man now. He's here for the betterment of AEW, but he's also here for some of that sweet Canadian maple syrup. He said he watched Brian Danielson against Katsuyori Shibata on Collision, and he hopes that all the lads study that match. But afterwards, Brian, in one breath, said that he's grateful that he's stepping into the ring with Will Ospreay. But in the next breath, he said that Ospreay couldn't walk in his shoes. And maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. Because when he was in Japan, which he said is the place where Danielson wanted to be a star, he said that he's right. He couldn't fit into that. He couldn't fit into Brian Danielson's shoes. And do you know why? Because Brian's shoes were too small for him, bruv. So that was nice. That was a nice little shot there, Danielson. He said in Japan, he won the best of the Super Juniors twice. He won all kinds of championships, including the World Heavyweight title. But apparently he can't walk in Brian's shoes. You want me to prove it? Katsuyori Shibata. Long time no see. You know, seven years ago, he said he wrestled Shibata, and Shibata beat the piss out of him. He said he was 23-year-old Billy at that point. Now he's a 30-year-old man. He's got two pugs, three cats, a kid, a missus, a mortgage to pay, and more importantly, he's got a point to prove. So next week on Dynamite, Katsuyori Shibata, meet me in this ring. Danielson, sit at home and let me show you. What the Billy Goat is all about. I love it. I love it. I love this promo. This was great. That match with Danielson and Shibata, by the way, if you didn't see it on Collision last week, was great stuff. You should go take a few minutes to go find it and watch it. Uh, and, and it's one of those matches that a few years ago would have been a total impossibility for both men. Both men were hurt. Both men were retired. One man nearly died. One man had his brain taken out of his skull and put back into it. Thanks, Dave. And yet here they were on collision last week in just a TV match, a random TV match, wrestling one-on-one. -on -one. But I thought Osprey killed it on that promo. He has really shined these last couple of weeks uh, in these promos. And this one was better than the last one. Um, now, I know one thing he was working on. It's been a problem for him. He curses a lot. Now, that's one thing to do that on YouTube. But when you're on live television, you got to watch what you say. But it's just sort of ingrained in him. You know, it's how he grew up. And in New Japan, it was never an issue. And so he said he's had to really work hard to not just cuss in every interview that he does, every promo. Uh, that wasn't an issue for him tonight. And as time goes on, he'll get more used to it. I mean, had he gone to WWE, you know, he they would have sent him to the Performance Center 
just to work out his promos, if nothing else, so that he doesn't go on Raw and go, hey, bruv, you know, what, you know, he'll be on Raw one week and he'll be talking to Seth Rollins and he'll be calling him, you know, a piece of shit or something like that. Oh, sorry, bruv, you know, they'd send him to the PC to work out the kinks. So I'm not worried about that. I'm sure that'll be fine. Um, as he does more of these every single week, he'll get better and better and better and more comfortable. He's already comfortable. At it. You can tell he's got a big smile on his face when he's out there. He's having the time of his life. The fan reaction, he is he is just immersed in that reaction when he comes out and the fans are chanting for him. And he loves it. He feeds off of it. You could tell. He feeds off the energy of the crowd. Uh, there is something inherently likable about him when he is out there. And that's part of the reason why I've said that this is going to be your number one baby face in this company. He's already, if he's not number one already, he's he's 1B to whoever you would consider 1A to be. And I'll say this, they better get that world title on Swerve at Dynasty. They got to get that title on Swerve ASAP. Because come Wembley in August, this guy's walking out of there, I believe, the AEW world champion. And so if Swerve wants to get that run with that title, he better get that run in now. Although, honestly, I could see... You know, as time goes on, I could see Swerve and Osprey sort of be in that that feud that goes on for a while, and maybe they even trade wins back and forth. I could see that those two really going out there and being that sort of top feud in AEW. Uh, but yeah, they better get that belt on Swerve quick if he wants to get that first run of what may be multiple runs. But that first one, they better get him that title of Dynasty. Now we had Timeless Tony Storm and Mariah May taking on Deanna Perrazzo and Thunder Rosa. Rosa fought off May and Storm after a break with a top rope crossbody, took them both down. And then she made the hot tag to Deanna, who ran wild with a knee lift and a leg sweep. And she took Mariah's head off with a big boot. And then Rosa, who was practically standing in the middle of the apron, I don't remember who the referee for the match was. It's probably fucking Rick Knox or somebody. Uh, in fact, I'd almost guarantee you it was probably Rick Knox. But she tagged herself in. And Deanna was not happy about this. So Rosa comes in. She plants Mariah with a Death Valley driver. Tony Storm, though, hits a snap German suplex in the corner. And then she delivered a wicked... I mean, they all look wicked. Uh, the way she comes barreling in and that, that whiplash effect, the sweet ch uh, cheek music. When she tried to follow that up with Storm Zero, though, Rosa countered into a jackknife pin, and she got the win for her team. And Deanna, again, was not happy about this. She was not happy when Rosa tagged in, and she was not happy when Rosa won the match for her team. So I guess the, uh, I guess the idea here is supposed to be because the announcers pointed out that Deanna was angry, but that's just sort of where they left it. And I assume the story here is that Deanna wants to get back in contention for Tony's title, and she is trying to prove that she is worthy of another women's championship match. But then Thunder Rosa comes and steals the spotlight and takes the win for her team. And not only does she take the win, but she pinned the champion. So I assume that's what irked Deanna Perrazzo, but... I'm just trying to make sense of it because Deanna is the one who picked Thunder Rosa to be her partner. And her partner won the match and this upset her. There's really no other conclusion to draw here. Don't pick a fucking partner if that's going to bother you so much. I'll tell you what I'm more upset about. I'm more upset that Rosa ate that sweet cheek music and then no sold it. <laughs> totally no sold it. Got the jackknife pin, popped right back up, looked none, look, look perfectly fine. Totally no sold the move. Um, and it would bother me that the champion got pinned were it not for the fact that I have to assume Rosa is going to get the title shot at Dynasty. Right? I mean, of course. It's going to be Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm for the AEW Women's World title. I expect that match to be made official imminently. I'm surprised Tony Khan didn't already have a graphic on the screen ready to go as soon as the referee counted three. Swerve wanted somebody big, he said, for his open challenge. And he got somebody big, not necessarily star power-wise, but physically, he got the Butcher. And this did not last very long, but it didn't have to. 
Butcher turned Swerve inside out with a clothesline. Swerve popped right back up. He hit a standing double stomp, hit the house call kick, and then went up top and hit the Swerve stomp, but he didn't win with the Swerve stomp. Instead, he applied a modified short arm scissors submission and got what the announcer said was his very first submission win in AEW. After the match, Swerve stood in the ring. He had a chain around his neck. And I don't know if he was going for the junkyard dog look or what he was doing here, but he said that he had a lot of respect for Samoa Joe before he met him. As he got to know Joe, he has stopped liking him to the point where he is almost hating him. Every day he thinks about wrapping a chain around Joe's neck and choking him out. But the chain he has is not big enough for Joe's thick neck. And Swerve said that he will take out everybody in his path until Joe gives him what he wants. Give him what he wants! Samoa Joe walked out. He was in a suit. Said logic should dictate that he should ignore Swerve. See, another man who actually tries to use logic. This is what I like about Joe. I've been trying to apply logic to these shows for years. It's so hard. But he said logic would dictate that he should ignore Swerve. He already beat him at Revolution. Strickland still believes the impossible is possible and he can box with a god. The problem with that belief is that the fans will start believing that they could also be champion. That is until Joe shows up, smashes you in the face, and takes everything that you have. And Joe said that what to do with Swerve? What to do is to give him exactly what he wants. And as Joe started towards the ring, Don Callis walked out on stage. Canada's own. Massive booze for Don Cows. He brings up how Strickland and Kanosuke Takeshita, they have the same number of wins. So maybe Takeshita should show Strickland what it's like to lose to the Don Callis family. He said AEW is not Swerve's house, it's the Don Callis family house, which just doesn't roll off the tongue quite the same way. Swerve said that if he had more time, he would burn the Don Callis family tree down to a crisp. And he accepted the challenge and said that when he is done with Takeshita, he is coming for Joe. And I shit you not, within three seconds, we had Excalibur. I'm being told that Tony Khan has made it official. And wouldn't you know, they already had the graphic up on the screen almost before Swerve was even done talking. I don't know why they don't just wait. Just wait a little bit. Would it kill you to wait? So apparently, uh, Don Callis went to Tony Khan before he walked out there, told Tony Khan, I want this match. I'm about to go out there and announce this match, put the graphic together, get the production team on it, and make sure it's up on the screen by the end of this segment. And boom, there it was, right there in the corner of the screen. So we now have Swerve and Takeshita, and we have Osprey and Shibata. That automatically makes next week's show a must-see for me. Now, once Swerve beats Takeshita, we should get the official announcement of Swerve and Joe. because Joe was already halfway down to the ring to take him on before he got interrupted. So we already know where this is going. We're going to get Swerve and Joe one-on-one -on -one this time at Dynasty. Uh, Takeshita makes for a nice roadblock. We still have four weeks until the pay-per-view. You got to do something with Swerve. I don't want to see him wrestling people like The Butcher every single week. You got to put him in there with somebody of note. That'll be a big win for him. He will have earned the right at that point to challenge for the title. And uh, it's going to be one hell of a match that we're going to get out of it. I think that match is going to be great next week. Speaking of great, that leads us to the main event, which was Adam Copeland one-on-one -on -one with Christian Cage. Copeland Christian Part 3 for the TNT Championship here in Toronto in an I Quit match. Excalibur said that they would stick with the action as long as they needed to. I sure hope so. They got three hours of real estate to work with tonight. What are they going to do? Get cut off by Rampage? Actually, they kind of did get cut off by Rampage. The, the screen blacked out for about two seconds, and then it quickly came back on. I guess that, that signaled that we have now moved on from Dynamite to Rampage. But I, just, I heard that, and I just laughed. I'm like, what are you going to do? Gonna cut the show off? So Copeland and Christian, they almost immediately, they fought into the crowd. And Copeland, he ripped a Boston Bruins jersey off of 
one fan. He took the shirt off the guy, and he put the Bruins jersey on Christian. As soon as the fans saw the Bruins jersey, they all booed. Then he grabbed a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey, put that on himself, got a huge pop, and then the two of them started throwing down hockey style. Crowd was going nuts for this. Copeland then pulled Christian's jersey over his head, and he started to lay in some shots. This was quite the sight. And uh, like I said, the fans were going crazy for it. You know what it reminded me of a little bit? It reminded me of Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn at Payback last year. They were in Pittsburgh. They had that Steel City street fight with Finn Balor and Damian Priest. And uh, I don't know who was wearing what jersey, but like in the middle of the match, Owens and Zayn got taken out. But then when they reappeared, they had on a Mario Lemieux jersey. The other one had a Sidney Crosby jersey. Owens was bleeding. They had hockey sticks. It's kind of what it reminded me of. And that was a fucking great match, too. Anyway, that took us into the picture and picture break. Copeland tried to place a ladder over the barricade in the apron, uh, but the ladder was too short. And so he placed it over the barricade in the announce desk instead. Christian fought back. He climbed onto the ladder, and Copeland joined him on the ladder and pulled him backwards onto the ladder for an edgematic, which looked like it hurt Copeland as much as it hurt Christian. Copeland brought the ladder inside the ring and set it up upside down. The fans at this point, they started chanting TLC. Copeland picked up Christian and dropped him on the, I guess you would say, the uh, the innards of the ladder. Does the ladder have innards? The, the bars, the internal bars, whatever. The springs, the hinges, whatever the fuck you want to call it. He dropped him right on it. It looked like it sucked. That's all you need to know. Copeland pulled the table out from underneath the ring and leaned it against the barricade. And he tried to spear Christian. Christian leapfrogged him and then poked him in the eyes before running him into the ring post. Copeland came up bleeding from the forehead. And Cage went up top. Now, Copeland's outside the ring. Christian's on the top rope. He comes diving off. And the momentum sends Copeland crashing through the table that was propped up against the barricade. After this, Christian set the ladder up over the middle ropes and then catapulted uh, Copeland into it. The referee checked on Copeland, who refused to quit. At least this wasn't Roddy Piper, WrestleMania 11, with uh, Bret Hart and Bob Backlund every five seconds. What do you say? What do you say? To the point where, like, the fans were, were laughing. They're actually laughing at the match. It's probably why Bret says it was the worst match he ever had on pay-per-view in his life. So the referee was not nearly as annoying as Piper was in that match. So the referee uh, checked on Copeland. Like I said, he refused to quit. Copeland came back with a cross face. Christian gouged his eyes to escape. Both men hit simultaneous spear attempts. Their shoulders collided. Both men were down, heading into picture in picture. Cage tried to leave during the break. Copeland caught up to him, though, on stage. And he catapulted Christian off the stage onto the floor down below. Copeland brought out a hockey goal. And he draped Christian across it before scoring a goal with him. All the hockey nuts in the crowd went, which pretty much is the entire crowd because it's Canada. So I just assume that everybody in Canada must be a hockey nut. I mean, it's, it's pretty, you're probably born into it, I would imagine. So, of course, everybody in the crowd was going nuts. Mother Wayne walked out, and I don't think she's a hockey nut. Mother Wayne walked out with a hockey stick and low-blowed Copeland with it. And I figured he was wearing a protective cup, right? All this hockey crap. They have all the equipment. They have, we have, we still have the hockey stick. We have the hockey goal. We have the hockey jerseys. Why wouldn't he be wearing a cup? He wasn't. You would think that he would learn by now. These people will never learn. Cage then broke the hockey stick over Copeland's back. He threw him back into the ring. Cage was jabbing Copeland in the throat with one of the broken parts of the hockey stick. The referee checked on Copeland. He barely responded. He was asking him, do you quit? Do you quit? Then honestly, it sounded. It didn't sound like Copeland said anything. So if I were the referee, I would have called for the bell right then and there. So maybe he said no, and it was very faint, and I just didn't hear it, but... Cage went to ringside. He pulled out two chairs. And then he pulled out another chair. This one was wrapped in barbed wire. 
which by the which reminds me actually i'm glad i thought of this i have to say i have to thank someone i'm actually going to i'm going to thank someone who is a part of our streams in fact i think he uh, dropped a super chat earlier but i i just want him to know how much i appreciate this gift and i've gotten some some wacky gifts in my day this one was completely unexpected and i thank him for it but uh I received this. The Jesus Christ! I received this the other. <laughs> gotta be careful here. This is this is real. This is real. This is from Oz and Glorious. Oz and Glorious shipped this off to me the other day, and uh, I I didn't know what to expect, so I was I was surprised when I got it, and I don't know exactly what I'll do with it. Although I did say that if anybody ever breaks in, I know exactly what I'm going to use. At least I know what I'm going to use for protection now. I got Barbie here with me. Now you, now you could call her Barbie or uh, whatever Negan called his bat. Forgot his wife. Forgot his wife's name already. But yeah, oh, Lucille. There you go. Thank you. Yes. This is my Lucille. We'll have to come, we'll have to come up with a name for it. Maybe we'll have a contest. I'll let you guys name my uh, barbed wire bat here, but uh, Oz and Glorious, thank you. I, I don't know what to say, but thank you. I do, I do appreciate that. It was quite unexpected. As that made me think of that. Literally just got that the other day. So he brings the uh, chair wrapped in barbed wire and the other chairs into the ring. And Cage placed Copeland's head on top of one of the chairs and wound up with the barbed wire chair, went for a concerto. Copeland moved out of the way at the last second. So Copeland now, he picks up the broken hockey stick and he catches Cage in the throat with it. And then Copeland placed the stick in Cage's mouth and he wrenched it back. But Cage still did not give up. Now here comes Kill Switch and Nick Wayne. They hit the ring, they attacked Copeland, Kill Switch and Nick, they held Copeland in place while Shayna got into the ring and she slapped uh, Copeland right across the face. This brings out Daniel Garcia and Matt Menard. And they run out, they fight off Kill Switch and Nick Wayne. Copeland planted Kill Switch onto the barbed wire chair with the DDT. Nick got tossed out over the top rope and when he went flying over the top, his foot caught uh, Kill Switch right in the head on the way down. If it was anybody but Nick Wayne, who looks like he's 150 pounds, that might have actually knocked Kill Switch silly, but I'm sure for him it was like, you know, he, he got bit by a mosquito. So Copeland scaled the ladder in the ring. He dove out of the ring onto Kill Switch and Nick Wayne on the floor. Copeland rolled Nick back inside. Garcia was waiting with handcuffs, and Copeland cuffed Nick in one corner of the ring, and then Garcia... Do you feel him, sir? I do feel him, sir. Oh, look who it is. It is Oz and Glorious. Say the man's name and he appears. Look at this. Lucille, let's fucking go, Lucille. You're welcome, my dear. Well, thank you again. Thank you again. I already thanked him in private. Now I got to thank him publicly here on the street. I know what I'm using the next time somebody gets in this, uh, if anybody ever comes in here who don't belong here. Going to have little bits of hair and skin hanging from it. Maybe I'll even douse it in some lighter fluid and take a barbecue lighter to it. Oh, we're going to have a grand old time here with uh, Lucille. I need to call it Brie Mode. You want me to call this Brie Mode? I don't know, maybe. So Garcia and Menard, they cuff Kill Switch in the other corner. So now Nick Wayne is cuffed. Kill Switch is cuffed. The baby faces now, they surround Shayna. Shayna's like, I'm out of here. And Shayna Wayne leaves the ring. Garcia and Menard, they punch Christian. Copeland then spears him. Garcia and Menard, they handcuff Christian Cage in another corner. Copeland goes to ringside, and he grabs his box. And he grabs his box, not, uh, not Shayna's box. He grabs the box that was under the ring. It says Spike on it. He's been flashing this on TV. We saw, you know, the other week what was inside of it. Basically, it's a board with nails in it. 
Now, I'm old enough to remember when Abyss was walking around with Janus. So when I see the, the board with the nails in it, I don't think Spike. I think of Janus from the TNA days. So as far as I'm concerned, we, have, we had Janus make her return to TV tonight. And there's a story, if you don't know the story behind the name, I, I'm not going to get into it now. But anyway. So he had his board with nails. Now he goes over to Christian. And he starts to kick him in the nads over and over and over again. And Christian is cuffed. He's defenseless. He can't do anything to stop it. And he still won't give up. Referee says, do you give up? He says, no. So Copeland, he opens up the case. He pulls out Spike. And he slams Spike into Christian's nether region. Copeland winds up with the board when Christian still won't say I quit. This man has literally been nailed in the balls and he won't give up. So Copeland winds up overhead like he's going to hit him in the head with it and then he gives up. And just like that, we have a brand new TNT champion. He didn't give up when it looked like the man was going to hit him in the balls with this board with nails. But then he reconsidered when he was going to hit him in the head with it. See, now, if it were me, the minute I see that thing coming down south, I peace out. And I'm done. Here, you can have it. This belongs to you now. So after a 25-minute war, Adam Copeland, for the second time in his career, is the TNT champion. And as I said at the beginning of the stream, he is already a longer reigning TNT champion than he was the first time. So congratulations to him. Copeland walked over to Christian. He flipped him off. And he left the ring. This was the blow-off to this feud. I thought that Copeland Christian 3 delivered. I, I may have enjoyed their match at World's End a little bit more. Uh, they're, they're kind of even because they were both brawls. You know, very similar matches. Obviously, th this one you had to say I quit for it to end. Uh, but still, like, you know, weapons and plunder and all kinds of uh, smoke and mirrors and stuff. So very similar matches, but this was still excellent. I still enjoyed this match a lot. And the patriarchy finally gets their comeuppance after all these months of, you know, running roughshod. And we got a proper blow-off to the feud. And now... I don't know when they're going to do it, but you know now, at some point in the future, this now paves the way for an eventual Edge and Christian reunion, and we will get some Edge and Christian tag team matches. Now that they are done feuding, at some point they will be reunited. It's only a matter of time. Now, interestingly, Daniel Garcia placed the TNT title over Copeland's shoulder, and the way that he was eyeballing him, uh, I think we're looking at Garcia as being the first in line for a TNT title shot, maybe a dynasty. And so I wonder if it's just going to be a case of Copeland, you know, I say passing the torch, but, you know, trying to put Garcia over. I thought they would do it at Revolution, and they didn't. You know, Christian beat him. And so, because I just didn't feel this match needed the title. You could do a blow-off between Copeland and Christian. It didn't have to be for the TNT Championship. But they chose to have Christian go over and retain. And so now I wonder if the plan is for him to put Garcia over. And they, they crown Garcia as the new TNT champion. But would they take the title off Copeland so soon, I wonder? You know, he didn't have the title for very long the first time. Do they want to give him a run of a few months at least? Uh, maybe they want to build to him having a, a big title defense at Wembley in August. So he has a few months, you know, to hold on to the championship. Maybe they, maybe they do it there. Maybe they don't rush everything for Dynasty. You know? But clearly Garcia is still in the mix. Him being involved... And him eyeballing Copeland at the end, clearly that's going to be a direction at some point soon. Um, but this was the third week in a row where this show felt more focused. It breezed by, it went by very quickly, but not, you know, in a bad way where it felt like they suffocated you with so many things, too many things for it to really matter. Uh, I like the vibe the show has had over the last few weeks. And this felt like, and we're not done yet, we have one more dynamite, but this has felt like the strongest month creatively, the strongest month of Dynamite in years. I don't want to say the strongest month because 
you know, we, we had those peak years of Dynamite a few years ago, but this, this was up there as the best month of television that this company has had so far uh, in a very long time. And I hope that it continues beyond this month. I hope it continues into April and beyond. Now, we were not done. We were done with Dynamite, but we were not done yet because we had an extra hour of AEW tonight because Rampage aired live because of March Madness not airing on Friday. In fact, I don't think there's any collision on Saturday. I think they said collision returns next Saturday. Uh, so that's being preempted as well. I was originally going to go live at my normal time and not even bother with Rampage. And honestly, the only reason I really even wanted to see Rampage was because I thought something might happen. In like a storyline development, Mercedes would show up or Statlander might go heel. I thought something was going to happen at the end of that tag team main event. And as it turned out, Mercedes was not on the show, and there was no major storyline development. But I am glad that I stuck around for the main event, because the main event was uh, really the only thing worth watching on this show. It was it was Rampage. It's a reason why I don't bother reviewing Rampage every week, is there's no point. You know, it might be an easy hour for people to watch, but it's not worth me, you know, staying up late after SmackDown to watch an hour of fucking Rampage. Uh... And I was trying to think before, when was the last time I even did a Rampage review? Pretty sure it was probably three years ago, right? It was probably 2021. It's been a while. I'll go through this uh, really quickly, and then we'll get to the uh, street fight in the main event. But let me just give you a sense of what happened here. So they did have a segment pre-taped earlier in the day. They were outside poolside somewhere. It was Bullet Club Gold. The guns were lounging out. Jay White was there. He was making fun of Darby Allen. He was saying that he saved Darby's life, <laughs> which, you know, in a roundabout way, he may have. Uh, they did that storyline foot injury or the ankle injury uh, at Big Business last week. Darby, as it turned out, really did break his foot. I don't know if it was the foot that they, you know, broke on TV or if it was the other one. But he broke his foot two minutes into his match with Jay White last week. He did a somersault dive from the top rope to the floor, and just the way he landed, he broke his foot. Three bones in his foot. So he will not be climbing Mount Everest this year, which probably means that it did save his life. I think that happened for a reason. I really do. So anyway, he said now Darby is free to do whatever, anything outside of climbing Mount Everest. And then at the very end, they showed a skeleton coming down the pool slide. I guess that was supposed to be Darby. Renee welcomed fans to Rampage. She was out on stage, and she introduced the acclaimed. Out came Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. No Billy Gunn, who was injured at the hands of Jay White last week and was not medically cleared to travel. Uh, but this segment, my God. I thought this segment would ne never end. Never, ever end. This segment went on and on, and Caster in particular was really not great. Bowens was better, but Caster talked about Jay White being a fake tough guy, hides behind the ass boys. Caster uh, offered Jay a one-way ticket to New Zealand or New Japan, said White would not take him up on the offer because he's not smart. Whatever. Bowens apologized to the fans for not being as happy-go-lucky as they normally are. He said that he was pissed about Bullet Club Gold not coming to Canada. Those guys know they are not elite enough. I mean, this just, again, this just went on and on, them going after Bullet Club Gold. And, uh, yeah, I didn't like this segment. I thought this segment was very weak. We have Powerhouse Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher representing the Don Callis family, taking on Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta in a wild card qualifier for the tournament for the vacant AEW World Tag Team titles. Poor Powerhouse Hobbs. This guy in this match was a beast. At one point, he had Orange Cassidy outside the ring. He had him. He's holding this guy. And he was slamming him down. He looked like the Incredible Hulk. He was slamming him over and over and over again down on the apron. Get your ass back inside. He threw him in the ring, man. Hobbs looked like a fucking beast, and he's still lost in this match. Hobbs is another one. Kind of like Wardlow, but he's not quite, I, like, I wouldn't quite say he's as sad as Wardlow is. He's not there yet. But I kind of put him in the same camp of, like, what are they doing with this guy? Are they ever going to do anything of note with this guy? 
Hobbs and Cassidy, they ended up at ringside. Like I said, Hobbs was ra just ragdolling him up and down. And Kyle Fletcher ended up bleeding from the mouth. I didn't see how it happened, but he was bleeding from the mouth. He caught Cassidy with a kick in the corner and set up for a superplex. Beretta, though, got uh, back to break things up. He had been taken out. Beretta hit a half-and-half half suplex from the top rope. Cassidy followed with a jump from the ropes into a DDT. And then he hit Fletcher with the orange punch and scored the win. Man, he had a super competitive match on TV with Will Ospreay. And he didn't win. I don't know that anybody expected Kyle Fletcher to beat Ospreay in that match. But he goes from that here and he loses. He, he eats the pin here on an orange punch and loses it for the Don Callis family. And isn't he still the television champion of Ring of Honor? Right? I mean, I, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Ring of Honor, honestly. I don't know. Although, the only thing I know, I believe that Athena and Sheeta, if I'm not mistaken, are feuding. I try to pay attention at least to what Athena is doing, and I continue to be flabbergasted that this woman is banned from Dynamite and Collision. CM Punk is not around anymore, and still people are being banned from these shows. I don't know why. We have all these other Ring of Honor champions, the Ring of Honor six-man champions, the Ring of Honor world champion was on the show tonight, the Ring of Honor television champion. By the way, that reminds me. Did we not just see the Ring of Honor world champion and the Ring of Honor television champion both get pinned on this show tonight? And you're going to tell me that Ring of Honor is worth a shit when it comes to the way that they book these titles and the way that they book these people, really? You're going to try to convince me that Ring of Honor means a shit at this point? Are you fucking kidding me? It just hit me that two of the top champions in Ring of Honor were both pinned on this show tonight. But the women's champion is, for whatever reason, the only champion who can't get a match, she can't get a promo, she can't get anything on this show. I don't get it. Doesn't make sense. So anyway, Cassidy and Beretta are moving on in the tag team title tournament. I mentioned the Young Bucks are going to be wrestling Private Party on Dynamite next Wednesday. We had Katsuyori Shibata and uh, Kevin Matthews one-on-one, -on -one, who I believe uh, used to be with TNA, if I'm not mistaken, right, as KM. So they were hyping up Shibata's match with Will Ospreay next week. This was a showcase match for him. Uh, he ended up picking up the win with the uh, PK. Backstage, they showed Adam Copeland. He was having a big celebration for his TNT title win. And what a sad celebration this was. He was sitting on a, a, an equipment case in the backstage area, and he was hanging out with Orange Cassidy, Trent Beretta, Chuck Taylor, uh, top Flight was there. I think Action Andretti may have been there. Daniel Garcia and Matt Seidel. <laughs> Just sitting on an equipment case. I think he was drinking champagne. It's pathetic. This is a pathetic celebration. Come on, man. You're in Canada. You're from Canada. You just won the title. This may be his final title win of his career. He may never win another championship again. This could be it for him. You got to hit the town. You got to put on your nice... Well, he's married, I guess, right? Eh. I guess he can't have fun. But anyway, so we had Kanosuke Takeshita one-on-one -on -one with Rocky Romero. Uh, all I will tell you is that Takeshita hit an inverted pile driver, and then he immediately wheelbarrowed Rocky Romero up and then spun him and hit this awesome-looking blue thunder bomb. And I thought, that's got to be it. That's the perfect finishing sequence. That looked great. And Rocky Romero kicked out. Now, all due respect to Rocky Romero, who's well-traveled and well-respected and a veteran. Takeshita doing that sequence to Rocky Romero should be the end of the match. You don't need Rocky Romero to kick out of that. But he did. So Romero came back briefly. Takeshita cut him off with a clothesline. And then he took his elbow pad off. He hit a rolling elbow strike. And then a Falcon Arrow to win the match. A win for Takeshita, much like with Shibata, to give him some momentum going into the big matches on Dynamite next week, so no surprise there. And the main event. The real reason why 
watch this show in the first place, was a street fight with Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander taking on the TBS champion, Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Finally, a champion who won a match on this show. Eddie Kingston lost. Tony Storm lost. Christian Cage lost. Julia Hart. Kyle, uh, Kyle Fletcher lost. <laughs> this was, I'm telling you, this was not, this was not a good night to be a champion in AEW or Ring of Honor, but Julia Hart pulled it out in the end. I believe she was the only champion to actually win a fucking match on this show tonight. But I, I don't think we needed two street fights. I mean, this is my thought coming into this. I said, you know, the crowd was very quiet at the beginning of this match. And part of it may have just been the fact it was the end of three hours. It may have been the end of four hours. They may have taped some Ring of Honor stuff before Dynamite. I don't know. So maybe they were tired. And But we just had Copeland and Christian. You know, call it whatever you want. I quit. It's a street fight. You know, they had a street fight. We had tables. We had ladders. We had boards with nails in them. We had barbed wire. And now you're giving us another street fight, right? It's exhausting. And you had two main event caliber performers, including a Hall of Famer, and what should be a future Hall of Famer, in that match. And that's not what this was. So this had no heat early on. To their credit, coming out of the commercial break, they got a lot of, uh, a lot of reaction from the audience for what we saw coming out of the break. They definitely got into the match the deeper they got into it. But before that commercial break, Julia Hart grabbed a spike. Didn't we see Spike already? Didn't I just talk about Spike earlier on? The board with the nails in it, right? He called it Spike. Now we got an actual Spike. Oh, I forgot. the F Now the FTW champion doesn't count. Don't give me that FTW bullshit. Don't give me that FTW champion nonsense. I don't count the FTW title. That is not an officially recognized AEW title. Not to me, it's not. My point still stands. So Julia grabbed an actual spike, and she tried to hit Chris Statlander with it. Sky Blue, though, took the spike to the head by accident. And she came up bleeding. She was bleeding from the, uh, from the hairline. Statlander and Willow, they set up two tables next to one another at ringside. So uh, remember that, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Sky Blue hit a uh, code blue on Willow on top of the announce desk, which did not break. In the ring, Blue poured out a bag of thumbtacks all over the ring. Statlander pulled out a bag of her own, added to the pile. Blue ended up power bombing Statlander from the middle rope onto the thumbtacks. And when she covered her to try to pin her, it looked like Statlander got her shoulder up a little late. But then again, this woman had tacks sticking out of her back. So I think we can uh, cut her some slack. Sky Blue picked up a handful of thumbtacks, put them in Statlander's mouth, and then super kicked her. Blue climbed the ropes. Willow finally recovered, got up on the apron, cut her off, got her on her shoulders, and then Willow Nightingale proceeded to deliver a Death Valley driver off the apron through two tables down below. That was nuts. By the way, this is coming off of, I should point this out. I think this is something that's worth pointing out. Last week, we had Willow and Riho as the main event of Dynamite. Last Monday on, uh, this past Monday on Raw, just the other night, we had Becky Lynch and Nia Jax. They headlined Raw. And they had a last woman standing match. And they had a very similar spot, in fact, where Becky gave Nia a manhandle slam off the apron through one table down below. This was on Monday. And I thought that match was excellent. But you have the, these women headlining the show tonight. You had Becky and Nia headlining the show on Monday. You go back to SmackDown last Friday. What was the main event? It was Bailey against Dakota Kai. And then Willow and Riho on Dynamite last week. And I don't remember what the main event of Raw last week was. But all of these shows in a row have had women's main events. And the last two... This one and the one on Monday, I thought, were very good. So I thought that was something worth pointing out. You don't see that all the time. You don't see that many shows in a row from different promotions on TV that have women's main events 
and in this case, a couple of women's hardcore matches. In the ring, Julia set up a stack of chairs in the corner. Statlander backdropped Julia onto the pile and then headed up for her 450 splash. Julia, though, moved out of the way, and Statlander landed knees first, which made me wince because of her history with knee injuries. And she landed on the chairs, knees first. The TBS champion then locked on her heartless submission. And Statlander had nowhere to go. There was no Willow to come to her rescue. She had gone through the tables. And Statlander tapped out. So Julia Hart and Sky Blue pick up the win. This turned into a hell of a match here. For a match that had no heat at the beginning. I mean, you could, you could hear the, the, the air conditioner in the building. By the time this was over, I mean, they were getting this is awesome chance. They were putting each other through tables. Sky Blue was bleeding. We had thumbtacks, all kinds of craziness here. And uh, this turned into a hell of a brawl. No Mercedes. She said she would be watching, but she did not come out. And there was no hint of anything as far as Chris Statlander, her attitude, or uh, anything like that. But Statlander is the one who took the loss for her team. So it could be that coming out of this match is where we're going to start to see some sort of transformation in her. I still feel like the match at Dynasty, the, the first opponent for Mercedes, is going to be Statlander. I feel like it's her. I don't think it's going to be Willow. You know, Willow has said she wants a shot at the TBS title. So I think she's going to go after that. And I think the first match for Mercedes is going to be Chris Statlander. And when she beats Statlander, if Willow wins the TBS title, we could be looking at Willow and Mercedes in a feud for the TBS championship. So, again, I, I enjoyed Dynamite a lot. This was probably the third week in a row, third or fourth week in a row that I thought the show was very strong. I enjoyed it. Rampage. I really just cared about the main event. And I thought those four ladies delivered. Yeah, Sky, that's right, Sky Blue. Sky Blue showed out. They all did. I thought they all looked great in that main event. So, uh, good for them. Let's take a look at the Twitter poll here. I, do, I don't have one up for Rampage, but I do have one up for Dynamite. And uh, what did you guys think of Dynamite? 61.6% thumbs up for this Dynamite show from Toronto. 20.7% give this show three stars. 6% two stars. And 11.5% give tonight's show one star. So 61.6% four stars is a uh, pretty good rating there. I would say. At Solomonster. You guys can go vote. Very, very good. Now I get to go through your super chats. Got some good ones here, so we'll go through these and uh, then we'll do some Be the Booker because we already hit our goal, which is always nice to see. So we'll be doing that a little bit too. Let's take a look at these super chats, shall we? Shall we? Let's go through your messages. I think Oz, Oz was the first one, of course, it's, is it showing up here? Let's see. Let's take a look and see. This thing has been very wonky. No, it's not. All right. We'll pick up with Ethan here in a second, but let's start from the beginning. We had Oz and Glorious who came in. Again, thank you for, you really want me to call this thing Brimo, don't you? This thing over here. Oz says, a damn fine night of wrestling, sold out crowd, and a stacked card makes for a great time. Tony Khan is not messing around right now. Yeah, again, I don't know what got into him as, as far as March is concerned, but this entire month, he's been uh, he's been turning out some big matches. Not including Revolution. I'm talking TV. Bobby's World. Saw this on Twitter. Better spinning heel kick, 1-2-3 Kid or Owen Hart? Uh, they both had very good spinning heel kicks, but honestly, I got to go with uh, Waltman. I think Waltman's just, he put a little something extra on it. His looked more devastating than Owen's. Owen's was more graceful, if that makes sense. So I, I gotta go with Waltman on the spinning heel kick. Jose Hitch. Assuming Tony Khan knew the schedule ahead of time, if it was possible, why not move big business to this week and make it a must-see three-hour event? Also, did you get to see Alien Romulus teaser? Uh, I did see the teaser, and it looks very good. 
because he wanted big business in Boston. I, I don't know how far in advance the schedule was set. I assume it was already, the buildings were already locked in months ago. And they're on a Canadian swing. They're going to be in Canada again next week. I don't know how many weeks it is, but they're going to be in Canada for a while, I believe. So big business was meant for Boston specifically for Mercedes. And we first heard about the Boston show at the beginning of February. He had Mercedes under contract for two months before she debuted. So that's probably the time frame that we're looking at here, and I assume these shows were already locked in. Ethan Rogers says, Pack versus Okada will be awesome. Yes, it will. I agree, Ethan. Hey, M. Mills, thank you for the 23 bucks breaking in our brand new Rock Super Chat. Thank you, M. Mills. Ecom see clearly. Fans have got on my last nerves. Thank you for being on this sobriety journey. I started last week. Thank you. And the chat, good night. Well, all the best in your journey. I'm very happy to hear that you are doing that. There's the quad squad. What a motley crew. Face Beerus. It seemed like Okada did not expect the pyro. LOL. I, I thought that was by design, though. Like he was caught off guard that his friends were giving him a pyro celebration. I think that was on purpose. Shayna Rooney. I lost count. How many dick kicks did Cope give Christian? Yeah, I lost count too. I would have just I would have given up before the first shot. Uh, also, I really feel like this is a new era of AEW, and it is going to be memorable. Well, it seems like that's what Tony Khan is is going for. The shows definitely feel more fun than they did a couple of months ago. Orhan says, I don't watch AEW. Why has Y2J become so hated now? <laughs> yeah, I don't have enough time to get into that. Uh, Oz and Glorious, again, thank you, yes. Let's go, Lucille. That's right. Justin G, gotta call the bat Bree mode. Maybe. Ed Swoggle, you should name the bat Tavish. Impossible to beat. Don't get me started. Base Beer says, There's definitely an anime character out there who uses a maneuver or kick like Nick Wayne's somersault heel to kill Switch's head. Uh, Jeremy Watley, Hey Solo, do you have a favorite female wrestler? At the moment? Uh, probably, uh, oh gosh, favorite female wrestler. I had to narrow it down to one. If you asked me that question last year, I would have said Jamie Hayter. Um, well, look, I'm a big fan of Mercedes once we actually get to see her back in the ring. I'm a big fan of Mercedes Monet. Uh, I like Rhea Ripley. I mean, if I had to pick one right now, I probably would, I probably would go with Rhea. So we can get Mercedes back in the ring. I'll stick with Rhea. Uh, we got Wapatapa says, off is the direction that Eddie Kingston can, can fuck. Uh, Base Beer says, Brett is not a fan of the quad squad. Brett's not a fan of a lot of things, and he's not afraid to uh, to tell it like it is. Hey, Beefy Canadian just became a Sound of Legend. Not just a superstar, but a legend. Hey, Beefy Canadian, thank you. Channel memberships are always open. Get those sweet emojis, and you get that... Uh, try to get the gold skull. We got the red skulls and the gold skulls in the chat. All right, I think that's uh, all of them, right? I think I got you guys. No, we don't. Peter, Peter Cordieri. Forgot Peter. Peter wasn't on the list. Peter just has an emoji here. What is this? Oh, it's a stick. Is it a sticker? I think it's a sticker. Hey, Peter, thank you, man. I think it's a sticker, but thank you for that. Appreciate it. So the goal tonight was 400. We are currently sitting right around 440. Thank you. Be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. 
Yeah, where is Jamie Hayter, says Chris Manson. That's a really good question. There have been no updates on her. I have not heard Tony Khan even mention her name. I don't know what's going on with her. I really don't. I mean, whatever it is, must have been a hell of a lot more serious than they were letting on. All right, be the booker. Here we go. Tag team, be the booker. We begin with Hulk Hogan and Edge. Very appropriate that we have Copeland on the show tonight. Hogan and Edge were tag team champions for a few weeks back in the summer of 2002. I believe they lost their titles to, uh, was it Lance Storm and Regal or Test? I know Lance Storm was one of them. I don't know who his partner was. Hogan and Edge are going to take on Randy Orton and Edge. <laughs> now, wait a minute. We had a mirror match on Monday with Willow Nightingale against Willow Nightingale. And now tonight, we have Edge against Edge. That's very impressive. That Edge is wrestling himself with two different partners. That's very impressive. Also, I realize that Edge has had some pretty, pretty incredible tag team partners in his career. All right, he teamed with Randy Orton. He teamed with Christian. He teamed with Hulk Hogan. He teamed with Rey Mysterio for a while. That's very impressive. Am I missing anybody? I might be missing someone. Man, Edge is everywhere. You can't get away from this guy. Well, at least we know that uh, Edge is winning, but Edge is also losing. All right, let's go to Women's Be the Booker. Hopefully not Willow versus Willow tonight. Hopefully not. All right. We begin with Kyrie Sane with the best elbow drop in the entire business today. Bombs away with the insane elbow. Look, that's a thing of beauty right there. Thing of beauty. And the elbow drop is not bad either. All right. Kyrie Sane is going to go one on one with Chelsea Green. What are we thinking? What are we thinking about this? I'm thinking Bell. I know Chelsea is doing the, the goofy gimmick, but Chelsea is a good wrestler. If you put Chelsea in the ring with Kyrie, I think they'd have a good match. Don't let, don't let this character fool you. Okay, one to go. We got one left. We got one left. And we begin with Head with Al Snow. It's not Al Snow with Head. It's Head with Al Snow. So we are getting Head tonight. And let's see who Head is going to be wrestling here in this main event. I already know what button I'm pushing, so it doesn't matter. Uh, well, let's finish this out and see who, who Head is going to step into the ring with. Or well, I guess he's not going to step anywhere because he has no legs. How is Head going to get into the ring? He's going to roll down to the ring, but somebody has to pick him up and put him inside the ring. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we'll give this a drum roll. It is Head. You know, I was going to give this the buzzer, but how can I give this the buzzer when it's Volta? Look at this. Volta is getting head tonight. And if anybody can bring head to a really good match, it's Walter. The only thing is, if he chops head, he'll land in probably the 17th row, and that'll be the end of the match. So... I was I was this close. I thought for sure that was going to be a buzzer, but it ended up with a bell, and that means we got ourselves a clean sweep. How about that? You think I'm kidding. If anybody can bring a mannequin head to a good match, yeah, there are certain wrestlers who they say, man, that guy can wrestle a pencil. That guy can wrestle a, a broom. 
This guy right here is one of those guys. Why should a head be any different than a broom? What's the difference? They don't have arms. They don't have legs. It's all the same. It should be no different. <laughs> the Toronto kid. <clears throat> were you at the show tonight, by the way, Toronto kid? The Toronto kid says he's giving head, not getting it. Well, hey, you know, whatever. Teach their own. Whatever makes you happy. Oz and Glorious says, regarding Chelsea Green, Matt Cardona is a lucky motherfucker. Yes, he is. Uh, Rumpelmane says, Chelsea Green feet. There you go. Thank you, thank you, Rumpelmane. I, I was waiting for that. Justin G has been a channel member for one full calendar year. Thank you, Justin. Toronto kid, you are the man. You are the man as well. All right, so fun dynamite tonight. And a uh, fun main event, at least on Rampage. But uh, yeah, I, I don't want to do three hours of this every single week. No, thank you. I get enough three hours on Mondays. I don't need to do that on Wednesdays. But I'm going to be back for two hours of SmackDown on Friday. No rock on the show this week, but we are getting back to the actual main event of this year's WrestleMania. We're getting Roman Reigns. We are getting Cody Rhodes face to face. And we're supposedly getting Rey Mysterio against Santos Escobar. We'll see if we get a, an actual match between them, because I still think we're getting that at WrestleMania. But before we get to Friday, all you guys need to pay attention to is tomorrow, because this is going up tomorrow. And uh, I, I just, I'm at a loss for words. I really don't know what to say. I really don't. When you see the bullshit that I had to put up with in this game, all I wanted to do was play the game. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to play the game for all of you. And it was nearly impossible to do so. How people pay 60 bucks for this game, I will never know. You will see what I am talking about tomorrow, a brand new Sound Off Gamer. Well over an hour long is going to be up for your viewing pleasure. And the Toronto kid just became a sound off superstar. Look at this. Who's in that avatar? I can't tell. Looks like a Canadian Mountie. <laughs> is, that a, is that a Mountie? I can't tell. Anyway, Toronto kid, thank you. I'll see you guys live on Friday night after SmackDown. Until then, take care, brush your hair. We'll do it all over again on Friday night. Yes, all I wanted to do was finish my story. You know what 2K can do? Off is the direction that they can fuck.